I'm Christian Chiller. Welcome to my podcast, an enthusiastic ramble through whatever has taken my interest the past week or so. Expect technology, games, history, travel, geekery, and as always, much, much more. Welcome to To Chiller Squeaks with me, Christian Chiller. Just another pure interview show yet again, whilst I try and figure out quite what I'm going to do with the links moving forward. Maybe that's coming in 2024. But it's a great interview, nonetheless, not recorded at an event, which has seems to have been constantly in life the past month or so, but actually a few months ago with Chris Adams, who lives here in Berlin, but we recorded it online. Chris Adams, the director of the Green Web Foundation, doing all sorts of interesting things with regards to making the internet and the various things we do on it more sustainable. So enjoy the interview and you'll hear from me again once that is finished. Enjoy. Guten Tag, Chris. Hello. Hello, Chris. This is very confusing. I actually think this may be the only time I've ever had a guest called Chris. I can't, that can't be right. <laughs> uh, if it helps, I could be Chris A uh, because your surname is not a, it doesn't begin with an A, right? So neither surname. I think we no, should be safe no, no, there. No, no, no. Yeah. But it, it's fine. It's fine. And at the moment, because we've actually known each other for on and off for a little while, we have a lot of weird shared connections. Yeah. We went to the same Indeed. university. I don't know if at the same time. Yeah. Maybe. When were you there? I was there from 2000. I think 2001, yeah. and I graduated in 2006 okay. because I took a kind of partway route by into running the student union comms yep. department, which meant running a website, relaunching a magazine and everything like yep. that. And then I went back to uh, finish my degree after that, basically. That's so I took a somewhat roundabout route Then I ended up working yeah, there roughly. in the IT department for a little while. Roughly the same time. This is uh, Westminster University in London. I was there 2000 to 2000. Four, 2001 to 2004, I think. So it's about the same time. I think we should be clear that the word Westminster is doing a lot of work when people talk about the University of Westminster. Yeah. Because the campus, if you did anything to do with media, it was actually in Harrow, in yes. Harrow which is zone <laughs> six. That's way, way, way out. So. Yep. <laughs> it was actually quite a nice uh, campus, but nowhere central whatsoever. No. <laughs> not, not close. Yeah. So, and then we've crossed over in the kind of tech writing space. I think last time I met you, yeah. you were... You were you were pushing isn't the right word, but you were talking about something called C4, I think. C4, yeah, yeah. not in the kind of like terrorism yeah, kind that, of framing. Yeah, that's also worth unpacking. Uh, there, uh, it, C4 yeah. as in the way to talk about software architecture that was initially created. I think it stands for context, components, classes, and oh, cripes, I forget the final point. Uh, it was the, a while the final ago. Point. It was a while ago. Yes. And that was at the Read the Docs meetup in yep. Berlin specifically. Yep. Which yep. is also where you live. We probably find we're yeah. five minutes from each other. But And then inadvertently, I've been getting more and more into, let's just call it sustainability aspects of computing. Uh, I've had mm -hmm. a few interviews already on the show and actually have at least two others in the can that haven't been released yet. And just inadvertently, I discovered that uh, you were now part of the Green Web Foundation, which is one of the many organizations, uh, not many, but one of the few organizations active in this space. So maybe let's just mm. start with, how did you end up there? Was it something you began or something you joined and, and why? I did not found the Green Web Foundation. So the Green Web Foundation is a Dutch nonprofit, mm -hmm. which is centered around the idea of us reaching a fossil-free internet by 2030. It was actually set up in the mid 2000s, mid to late 2000s, actually. But, and I, back then, I was working in a string of wacky environmentally or open data themed startups. Yeah. So one company was called Loco2, which stands for low CO2, but also locomotion, mm -hmm. but also adventurous travel, like going local man kind of thing. And I also worked for another company called Amy, which stood for Avoid Mass Extinction Engine. Where we managed to burn through wow. $20 million of VC funding from uh, from firms like O'Reilly AlphaTech, Amadeus, I believe, and uh, Union Square Ventures, figuring out all the ways you shouldn't try to sell sustainability. Wow. And that was the the what we ended up doing there was basically hire a bunch of scientists who'd worked on a bunch of the papers related to the IPCC. Mm. And 
we ended up getting them to kind of build models in JavaScript back before Node.js was a thing. So later on in, like, I think, 2012, we yeah. basically published all this data specifically around the carbon uh, models for working out the carbon footprint of basically everything we could find back then. And I basically went along that route. And then in 2019, I basically got in touch with these, the Green Web Foundation that was run at the time by Rene Post and Aaron Jan Teteru. These were two Dutch mm. uh, uh, Dutchmen who were kind of running a website that lets you check if any other website runs on renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to check a set of the most popular domains, yeah. to popular websites against this. And that was like a few million domains. And I figured rather than just like monster someone's API, I figured I should at least like knock on the door and contact them. And I did. And they said, yeah, by all means, go, for, you know, knock, uh, knock, knock yourself out. And that began a collaboration. And then from there, later on that year, I ended up applying to the German Prototype Fund. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the Prototype Fund, Chris? I am, but I'd imagine not everybody is. All right, I'll yeah. explain why that is then. So the Prototype Fund is a fund in Germany where if you are a freelance developer or kind of technologist, mm. you can work, they will give you, I think it was something like 47,000 euros mm -hmm. to work, to spend six months working on some kind of public interest project, as long as you're prepared to open source or open up all the, everything you learn yep. uh, as a result of that, yep. to kind of add to the digital commons, as it were. Yep. And that meant that I was then able to approach this foundation that had been running primarily on love and, yeah, just, just mainly love, basically, and donated servers, basically. And I was able to say, hi, I can work for you for free mm. for six months if we agree to open source the platform that you've been running, mm. maintaining for the last 10 years. And they were like, okay, yeah, uh, unsurprisingly. <laughs> and we open sourced that. And I used some of that money to start doing a kind of, I bought an Interrail card and yep. I did a kind of low fly, low carbon, low flying road trip all around Western Europe at various conferences yep. and running things like the OMG Climate Unconference in Berlin mm -hmm. and also in London during that time. And along the way, getting married as well, but like yep. that's another story. So it was very exciting. And from there, I ended up being very involved in the uh, foundation. I yep. was invited onto the board. And now I'm the executive director of the Green Web Foundation. And okay. we're a bit larger and we're an organization with probably, I don't know, a budget of around half a million euros these mm -hmm. days, doing work in a number of places. But I'll stop there and yeah. I'll talk about and I'll give you some space because yeah, there's a few let, things. Let's dig into that because unpack there. No, it's it's very timely now. You know, there's a handful of foundations and projects and all sorts of things around this space, all sort of covering different aspects of how we can make computing, whatever that may mean, computing, infrastructure, applications, et cetera, et cetera, a little bit more sustainable. So what is the Green Web Foundation looking at specifically? Because web is could mean many What's different things What's to the different internet, people. Right? But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can't, do you know how most people don't even know what a browser is? It's only nerds like us who really have strong opinions about browser brands <laughs> and stuff like that, right? The web is one of these issues as well. Yeah. People don't really know what the web stands for. Well, okay, by and large, it's a poorly defined term. And when we talk about the internet and the yeah. web, it's not really that many people like, well, actually, it's about port 80 and all the stuff like that, right? Most people don't care about that. And for the most part, the Green Web Foundation has been focused around a fossil-free internet. Yeah. And we say fossil-free internet because, yes, there are absolutely other kinds of protocols and things like that. But we're mainly thinking about how people access digital services mm. online. And the thing that you could maybe of interest is that why we use the word fossil free that might think that we only really think about green energy mm -hmm. and we do maintain like a checking service and mm -hmm. an api that gets typically between five and ten million checks a day wow. against this for various other websites yeah. and we publish data which lets people incorporate this into their own tooling and that is used by groups like a web page test mm -hmm. and the firefox browser mm -hmm. they actually use a library yeah. we create called co2js and our focus is primarily around energy, mm -hmm. but because we know that really the climate crisis is about power, not so much energy, we also do things like a fellowship mm -hmm. to allow people the space to explore some of the more systemic issues around this. And we also do policy work and publish reports 
to actually engage with the kind of wider set of discussions going on. Yeah. So one example of this might be the report that we created in 2021, which is called the Fog of Enactment in Digital Sustainability. And that was all about this notion that, yes, obviously there's an environmental impact mm -hmm. to computing. And yes, there's obviously a number of large companies doing work on this, but we also need to be prepared to critically engage with the claims that people make. And we also need to have data in the public domain so that we can actually talk about this and make more informed decisions and see better laws to kind of set the rules of the game, really. So we do a number of different things. And the way that we kind of word it ourselves, and I'll share a link, is basically... I think there's three areas. We talk about narrative shift, yep. which is changing a story that we want to talk about. There's applied sustainability, which is about working with technologists and working with people to essentially show that some of the ideas that we talk about at a narrative level are, can be implemented. And the examples might be extending Firefox to allow for yep. carbon aware, yep. like ca carbon intensity, or writing papers about how you can extend IPv6 for like carbon aware computing. Ah. And then there's a final part, which is about a data ecosystem. And that part there is us creating the data sets that yeah. we make available via APIs and as published data sets. But that's also us working with other people who we consider fellow travelers. And you might in that, the, the best, most recent example of that might be the work we've been doing with WikiRate, who are a kind of Wikipedia for CSR data. And what we've done there is basically take a list of the kind of top 20 internet companies by its usage mm -hmm. and then reviewed which of these companies have meaningful net zero targets uh, or specifically which of these might pass the BP test as in they are more transparent than an oil company best known for making everyone feel guilty about carbon footprints by investing lots of money in making people everyone care about personal carbon footprints back in the mid 2000s. So we do a wide set of things for a team as small as we are. Yeah. And so there's been a, a little bit of an increase in organizations in this, I don't want to say this space, in this discussion recently from- Space uh, is okay, yeah. Yeah, from uh, a couple that are sort of attached to the Linux Foundation mm -hmm. and also a lot of sort of projects that you may or may not have opinions on attached to various cloud mm -hmm. hosts, uh, a couple of open source projects that have come out of those mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of other sort of tooling aspects and things like that. I guess the interesting thing is the Green Web Foundation has actually probably been around longer than- all of those, if not most of those. Yeah. So where, where do you feel you fit into that landscape? Some cover more the infrastructure side, some cover the very much just purely like the, the web browser tooling and the yeah. kind of front end stuff. And I feel like you're sort of somewhere across all of those maybe. Is that? Yeah, I guess like, I mean, okay, the part of me wants to say, oh yeah, we're the OG sustainable, <laughs> you know, digital sustainability, but we're not. We, I think, I think the best way you can think about it is that when I first came in, got involved with mm. the Green Web Foundation, you know how there's this thing where technology, uh, where in technology, we're really, really bad at basically reinventing existing <laughs> concepts. Like, you know, we're going to have this well, midday very, very power good at hour. It, I think is what yeah, you mean. Well, okay. <laughs> well, it depends what, how, how you view it, right? You know how people like reinvent, you know, Uber has reinvented the bus but, oh, yeah, well, you can have people like do ride sharing at set times yeah. or you can have a t you will, will, will have a scheduled break during the day away from our work when we're doing remote work like these. I kind of was a little bit wary about trying to come in and to a field and not yeah. really recognize what workers have been done there before. And that was partly why we wanted to well, why I chose to get involved with the Green Web Foundation yeah. in the first place, because people have been working on this for a very long time just like in, in the environment, environment movement and other places. And it felt like a really important thing to actually recognize that work and build on top of it rather than actually just try and come in like you're the first person to ever think yeah. about this. And like you, I suppose the answer is, yes, we are, we, 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 we're kind of the people who we, we see ourselves as a continuation of these ideas. Yeah. And the fact that we've been around is actually quite helpful in some ways because yeah. Like I'm in my early forties now and I've got 
I told you, I mentioned before, all the ways we found out not to make money in various other venture backed startups and stuff like that. And I kind of feel that there's something to be said for for like bringing lessons already learned rather than learning it yes. all the hard way. Yes, yes, time. yes, yes. I really think we're, we're of a similar age, a similar name, a similar background and at a similar point in our lives. <laughs> I'm kind of, I've also come out of a, a few years of working for very different venture backed companies. Mm. And I'm kind of like, I think I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't need just more crap that no one really yeah. wants i'd like to find something more meaningful to do but anyway that's a, that's a bit of a digression so i'd like to go maybe under the surface first so things like the the yeah. hosting directory and the web yep. does your website run on green energy this is i suppose very much looking at the the host and infrastructure providers yeah uh, do you hook in I think when I first encountered this this concept was when I did a talk last year when I was working at an observability company and I wanted mm. to find a different technique and I looked at the ThoughtWorks has a, a tool which yeah. mostly hooks into cloud um, providers billing data to give you a rough idea yep. based on location and things mm. like that. Are you doing something similar there? Yeah. So there's a, there's, there's a few different approaches we take and essentially – the thing that we're relying on or the when the Green Web Foundation software was built back mm. here in the kind of mid 2000s was it was taking to taking advantage of the fact that there are more websites yep. than there are data centers. Yep. And uh, the idea would be that we would basically, if you put a domain in, you, that will resolve to an IP address, which will then resolve to a IP range that has usually been allocated to one company most okay. of the time or a okay. series of companies, right? Like a, they might, you might have a very large IP address, but that company that might then kind of allocate a subsection of that to one of its customers and vice versa all the way down. So essentially when you do a lookup, we look up the IP address, we see what entity, what company is actually responsible for that. And then if we can establish a link between that company and any kind of sustainability, so any, any kind of credible claims related to their use of renewable energy, then we will show a kind of positive mark. Right now, it's a smiley face. Yeah. And if it's if we can't find any information, we show a sad gray face. Okay. And uh, that's generally what we do. And that's how we do that link. So it's you might think of it as an allow list rather than a deny, li and deny yeah. list in this way. And because we've seen just quite impressive, not necessarily impressive in a good way, impressive consolidation of the internet in the last 10 years, you don't actually need to have that many providers' information no. uh, in order for you to actually draw some conclusions about what percentage of the internet yeah. is running by is, is is run by organisations who at least have some credible information in the public domain yeah. to back up some of their claims. And, and for those ones that, as far as I can tell, do you might better tell me more, mm. like AWS, GCP, Azure, who mm. all at least have programs around this yep. do you hook into them to get a bit more detail or you just show yes. people where they can find that so what we do and like if you were to look up maybe a website and uh, we will show all the kind of all the let's say you look up a website that was hosted by amazon in there some of their green regions because all of the large cloud providers publish their public ip ranges to make sure that they're accessible by people with various firewalls and things like that, mm. we can use that information. So we import that uh, information there, and we basically provide a link. We when 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 we find a match like that, we will then show all of the last the, the most recent sustainability reports plus the mm -hmm. documents of assurance from the different providers who may have, may, may have audited those claims so that you're able to see this information yourself. So if we say, oh, you've got, it looks like it's running on Google Cloud project, yep. uh, Cloud Platform, we will point to Google's information yep. that we have, likewise yep. with other companies. And yep. that's kind of what we do. And we also outline what we mean by green energy so that we have a degree of kind of transparency on that part there. Yeah. So I, I tried mine whilst we were talking. I use Netlify. It looks like they use Amazon, mm -hmm. which is unsurprising. <laughs> and that they're using some sort of CDN because I'm seeing Amazon Frankfurt. I guess yep. that's the lo the closest. And yeah, it's it's very green with lots of links, which yeah. is which is which is good considering they run a lot of the internet. That's that's not terrible. So <laughs> well, this is yeah, like in the UK, we've seen the Amazon and Microsoft together own 
70 to 80% mm. of the entire cloud market. So if you want to look at like, say the UK cloud market, you have, if you've got coverage of those two companies, yeah. you've got a lot of the checks basically done. And like whether having a quasi oligopoly is healthy for the internet in the long run yeah, or even for like, yeah. <laughs> yes exactly yes. But like this is kind of what i mean about the consolidation has meant that while you while, while we're a relatively small team we don't actually need that much information yeah now the thing i need to share with you is that we're a small company we're a small organization yep. so we while we write code and things to automate as much of this as we can we still we're only as far we're only as good as the time we're able to spend on yeah, this stuff. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so yeah. there is that. And yeah. there, we, there are various ways you can support us financially if you fancy, but <laughs> basically that's, that's the caveats we share yeah. about this information. I, I used to work in the sustainability space myself back in Australia, <laughs> and I, I know this, and I'm kind of also finding myself in a similar situation again where I have mm. about 101 things I want to work on. <laughs> anyway, <yeah. laughs> I don't need to go any further with that yeah. explanation. So let's jump to the the front end shall we say this is co2.js this has come up in a few places yes. i've seen a few talks from people i had a, a woman Ines on Ines, yeah uh, yeah a little while back and i've seen a couple of her talks and i've, yeah, I've been milling around this for a little while and this is mm -hmm. one of the tools that comes up a few times mm -hmm. that focuses as far as i can tell mostly on the I, I don't know it's hard to tell with javascript but on the quote unquote mm -hmm. front end and you say it runs in Firefox, which again may or may not give you only that side of things. But yeah, what I think I'd be I sort of have some ideas myself from experimenting with this in the past, but what sort of things will it tell you inside okay. Firefox or not? And and I guess what are some of the common the common uh, problems that that you will the tool will find that people can do something yeah, about? All right. So you it's best to think of a, of CO2.js, the software library, as a kind of vector for a series of different models or, 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 or it's a library that gives you access to, to either the most well-known and uh, discussed models for using to understand the environmental mm -hmm. impact of maybe a web page or, yep. or a server, or it's a way and, and this is possibly an extension of that previous statement, it's a way to access reliable data about how green or not green electricity might be in different parts of the world, okay. for example. So we have this used in um, EcoGrader and in web page test mm -hmm. and in site speed, all these web performance tooling. They use the sustainable web design model, which we've yep. implemented yep. inside CO2.js with the idea being that there were various other groups who were working with this, but if we all collaborated on a single shared yep. space, yep. then it made it comparable across them. So yep. like that's one approach that you would use, but that's not the only model that's inside there. So initially, before we were able to work with all the people in the sustainable web design kind of working group, I suppose, we, we I, the initial version of this implemented a library or a model that was written by the Shift project who are based in France. And uh, while I talk about the idea that there being different models, because different models may be suited in different ways, depending on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is these ones generally are assumed to be working in the front end for a browser, where yeah. you don't really have loads of access to the under underlying equipment. Now, the thing with Firefox is particularly interesting in my view, because mm -hmm. they're not using the sustainable web design model themselves. They're using the fact that they have easy access to carbon intensity data for something in the region of 170 countries. Mm -hmm. So when you use the kind of inspector tools inside Firefox, and I forget the... I forget the name specifically that gives you all the kind of yeah. cool flame charts and stuff like yeah. that. What they That is basically looking at the energy used by your system, like okay. your laptop right there. And it gives you like really, really detailed nerdy stuff. Yeah. So like it doesn't just give you the process of Firefox. It gives you the information within the threads that might be running in the page. So you can see the, the, the kind of CO2 per... Uh, CO2 used for that rendering thread mm. or a background worker or anything, that, anything like that. It's like ridiculous yeah. levels of detail yeah. for that. And that was done by honestly some proper voodoo reverse engineering of what's going on, the, on, on 
going on under the hood with the processes um, that fi- the, 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 Mozi- the team at Mozilla yeah. have been able to do. Like it's, I'm, I'm in awe of what they're able to get out of computers and, that way. And just, I mean, Firefox is a, is a wonderful browser, but is unfortunately very much on a yeah. downward it's slope. Less than 10%. Um, yeah. So for those who are using other browsers, <laughs> so um, all, all, other, all two of them, basically, how, what are we doing? Why, you, why would how, you go there? How, how can, can you do that? Uh, I mean, yeah. I could imagine someone like the Chromium team may implement something like this mm. and possibly even WebKit as well at some point. But in the meantime, mm. uh, how, how can other people get some of these insights? Is there a way you add it into an application or is there a plugin or what yeah. options? So there's actually, so if you're looking for that kind of level of detail mm. and you're using a kind of web performance tool, you can like, I'm just going to talk about Firefox first then I'll talk about <laughs> yeah, those yeah. other browsers that you spoke about. So there's actually an issue in CO2.js specifically right now talking about how to run the entire kind of super detailed version of a Firefox browser to look at a page to get to expose those metrics mm-hmm. if you want to understand what a kind of real user is likely to experience when they're visiting a web page. Now, one of the reasons we've chosen to go with Mozilla first, partly because actually I think in 2019 or something like that, I actually... I contributed some code to the browser and that helped me get some confidence yep. and understand how some of it worked and like there is also i'm going to sound like such a hipster saying this i'm sorry i live in Kreuzberg. mozilla's office is yeah. in Kreuzberg, yeah, no, so yeah. it was actually relatively close for me to speak <laughs> to some people there and ask uh, about some stuff there and like figure out oh can i do that or oh really oh that that's actually not as scary as i thought so there was like there's you know there's there's there are people who are friendly who help provide it but there's also there was also this kind of like post nation state BBC public service ethos yes. that yeah. I found oh, sorry, quite attractive. You, ignore me. Sorry. Yeah. I thought you were referring About, to a post they published a couple of years ago, but no. <laughs> no, no. It was this idea that like there's almost, I kind of figured if I'm going to give a bunch of my labor mm. to uh, any of these companies, all of which have revenues in the hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. at least, I would prefer to give it to one which has a very, very strong public service ethos throughout the entire organization. Yeah. Yeah. And that also, like, because because like it's this the actual underlying code, this stuff here, it's JavaScript or C plus plus. Yeah, it's something that can be then implemented by other organizations essentially. And that was my thinking behind it. Now it turns out that the code that is in that has been used by Firefox, I can imagine that say Chromium or other browsers could probably extract that part out and then run it inside their own mm. their, their own machines. The thing is. Most of the com- because you have a browser that's tied very much to the company that's associated with it. So, for example, Apple, they tend to they already have some of their their own initiatives about sharing energy usage figures, and they've for for a while they've been not so transparent about that stuff. Like uh, they come up with their own metrics and things like that, which you which is not necessarily what you want. And that, uh, whereas Firefox doesn't have that issue yeah. about conflicts of interest. Yeah. Likewise, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with Chrome, you have some of the same issues where we're like, well, we're not sure we want to expose some of that information. Yeah. So there is, that's why I found it easier to approach the, com- the company there because they didn't have the same vertical integration where they it might not be in their interest or they might say, well, we're not going to do that because our entire business is based around advertising. So therefore anything that gives people the impression they shouldn't browse so much might affect our revenue. So we're not going to talk about that at all. So I figured pushing on the open source nonprofit seemed like the better place to get this out. And hopefully that should embarrass the companies with trillion, the, the trillion dollar companies to actually do it themselves yeah, yeah. so they can expose these numbers. Yeah. But if I did want to use it, do I enable yeah. it in my own application and I get some kind of pro- – like how, how can I get that information if I, if I don't use Firefox somehow? I, I don't know. Oh, and, uh, and I've heard, you... I think I've heard other – I feel like Ines mentioned this, but let's get it from the whole – Yeah, so <laughs> Safari has these figures. Safari yeah. has this kind of energy figures inside there. Does it? I, huh. Yeah, it does. They, they have something about energy usage, but they don't – I I don't I can't remember what the units are. It's not like kilo or hours or anything that you might imagine using if you're working with carbon. We're working with yeah. energy, for example, and they don't talk about CO2 either. Although they have done some recent things with like grid awareness, I suppose. Yeah. So Safari have like energy demand for this, all right? Which is not it's not using a unit that I'm familiar with or confident talking about. Apple is and notorious uh, for this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <And laughs> likewise with Chrome. 
you can kind of, I think you probably could work out some of these figures if Chrome exposed some of these metrics, but I don't really know enough about Chrome to know what you do. Oh, actually, hang on. Yeah, there is a way you could do this. So it just occurred, I just remembered. There's another project called by the team at Green Code, Green Coding Berlin. Can you guess what Green Coding Berlin are into? You know, that's the name of their company, right? Yeah, they, Very, they uh, have built a tool. Yeah. <laughs> so they run a tool where you can basically run uh, a set of Docker containers ah, with okay. the Chromium browser inside it, okay. and they can look at it from the outside to yeah. get those figures. So that's actually what we used, or that's one thing we're using right now. I think that's called, it's called GMT. Yeah, Green Metrics Tool okay. is from Green yeah. Coding Berlin. Like it's it's so German, I love it, right? Like just really, really ex- self-explanatory of oh, what really. these, what, none of these kind of like fancy words or poetry, just like, no, it's exactly what it does. Exactly what do you well, imagine? Sometimes that's what you need, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah. So I'd like to, I'd be interested because I feel like this is an area that you're not covering and this is filled in by, some of the efforts from Linux Foundation and CNCF, that yeah. bit in the middle, you kind of have, mm-hmm. oh, we know these sort of rough ideas about these providers. We can see the mm-hmm. impact that you browsing this website and your machine is having mm-hmm. at this point. But yep. all those other bits, like the, the specifics of, you know, this website hosted on AWS is having this impact in the database and this impact in the uh, Kubernetes yeah. and all this kind of stuff is... Is not something you handle, but other other organizations are looking yeah, at so, like that. But yeah. Okay, so for that level, it's probably most useful to to so rather than us compete, we con- yeah. we contribute. Yeah. So we wrote the documentation. We contributed to the documentation to Scafanger, which is a Rust project specifically for you to get per process. Fig, um, energy usage figures mm-hmm. when you're working on the server. So we figured that was a more useful thing for us to do yep. when we contributed yep. there. No, and, we also, yep. Yep. and there's another project that we run called Grid Intensity Go, mm-hmm. which is a Go binary that you can use, which basically exposes a kind of Prometheus exporter yep. or a kind of open to a, an exporter that, that Prometheus can scrape, yep. which uh, basically provides carbon intensity information. So if you were to use Scafandra plus this, you would end up with numbers that are necessary for you to kind of mm. put into say Kubernetes and or something like that. I haven't, it's been on my to-do list for a very long time, but I think this is also yeah. what Kepler does as well, I, I think. Loosely. Kepler does, not quite. What Kepler does, Kep, it's more useful to think of Kepler as in the same kind of space as Scafandra yeah. in the sense that what they're doing is... It's EPPF, okay, I so, think, as well. Yeah, yeah they're looking at the... Level, yeah. uh, so they're basically, I mean, I think the technical term is counting jiffies in for Scafandra. Basically, it's how much of the time, CPU time in a given, in, in a given, say, set of seconds is allocated to Nginx versus yeah. something else because computers multitask and they yeah, share. Yeah, yeah. The, so that's essentially what they do. Now, Kepler actually works one level below that, yeah. I think. What, what Kepler is using eBPF. Yeah, uh, we, we the, can, we, we yeah, have had a few people stuff. covering that on the show, so we, we could we could talk about it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. All right. So that's what that's using there. Uh, it's not... It's not directly using the same Jiffy counting approach. It's using a subtly different mm. approach. But they, the, the wife, I, yeah, it's it's subtly different, but it's more or less to say it doing a similar job of basically saying this is what this process is using, and like this is the share of your compute yeah. that sh- you should allocate to this process compared to that process. It's got a very interesting kind of space recently, and something. I, I have a couple of ideas in my head. One, I want to do like a video and blog post about me greening my website, which I don't think will be particularly impactful because my website's not that complicated. But I know there's a few obvious things that I've almost intentionally left broken because I want to fix mm-hmm. from that perspective. <laughs> but I've also been thinking a little bit around, I feel like there's one gap, which now you've got me interested in maybe mm-hmm. contacting the the prototype fund about it. Sort of sustainable coding practices, especially from a back-end perspective. Efficiency of yeah. algorithms and that kind of stuff is something I've been thinking a little bit about because there's a lot of aspects where there's a certain level you can get to with making things uh, more efficient and you can use caches mm-hmm. and CDNs and all these sorts of things. My experiments showed that most of the emissions came from databases, of course, yep. but, but then what? And I don't honestly know how much you're going to be saving at that level. It's hard to say, of mm-hmm. course. But it's it's interesting, and I almost feel like we've come to this perfect this perfect moment in time 
you know, skeptically speaking, I think we've both been around sustainability long enough to know that sometimes your wins come from not the places you really want them to, but you have to celebrate them. And, you know, a lot of companies are trying to uh, cut costs at the moment. And inadvertently, yeah. saving energy cuts costs. So so there's a motivation to 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 do this, mm-hmm. or whatever the reason yep. may be. <laughs> and that's okay, I suppose. It's an interesting time. And you've mentioned quite a lot of things you're doing, which is quite a lot. What's mm-hmm. next? Six months to 12 months? What's the, uh, what's the plans as much as you would love to to be anyway? I mean, I kind of feel there's a, there's a couple of things. So... I think the so one of our one 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 of our one of the one of the people who we work with Ross he's actually you mentioned Kepler he's written a few really nice blog posts both about the use of Kepler and basically the difference between scaffolding and stuff like that because he's quite involved. We actually one thing that we've been doing in the last couple of years mm-hmm. is actually working with various industry bodies uh, or. Or, or, or policymakers. So yeah. there is a really, really exciting, in my view, project called the Real Time Cloud Standard, which has been developed with the Green Software Foundation, yeah. not the Green Web Foundation, the Green Software, the yeah. larger industry body. Yeah. Yeah. We're active in there, and I'm the chair of the policy working group there. So that's how, like, I guess we we do things there, I suppose, as well as doing our own stuff. In the next over the next six months, we have. Actually, you might be interested in this, mm-hmm. or it, maybe it'd be good to tell people. We run a fellowship program where we give people a, a few thousand euros to research a particular project, specifically if it's related to like climate and climate yep. justice and some of these kind of more crunchy, interesting kind of issues. We literally launched the fellowship yesterday. We launched the <laughs> Open Up again. So this is our third oh, okay, year. Right, okay. So we've done two, two, two sets of it. So we've got people who, kind of, who have worked in big technology firms they then talk about, okay, these are the levers available. This is how you might redesign an entire economic model to incentivize solar-powered hosting. Yeah. We've got someone who was in Colombia. When she was in her 20s, she basically sued the government of Colombia to make sure that they would allocate rights to write into the constitution that, yes, they need to protect their own forests after all, yeah. because that actually because the government has a duty of care to future generations. So, oh yeah, and they won, by the way. So we have like fellows who do this kind of stuff. So they write about this stuff and they talk about kind of, yeah, all these wider things rather than just measuring your your own code. But we also have people who talk about measuring code and stuff like that. So there's a fellowship we have. There's some policy work we're looking to do. So like I'm currently preparing a talk for a... A session next week and in Paris at the IEA, where that's the International Energy Association, where, all, where there's a whole discussion about okay, how do you integrate data centers into, mm. I guess, like the energy system, mm-hmm. and how do you actually hit the kind of climate targets that we have set as a society, and how do you do that in a way that's both equitable, that it decarbonizes things, but also provides a degree of resiliency, because as we're seeing more and more and more. You can have like, say, decarbonized stuff, but if you don't have the resiliency, then you lose uh, access to connectivity, you lose access to energy, then Mm. it's really, really, really bad, right? So there's a bunch of stuff we do there. So there's policy work, I suppose, and working with the existing industry bodies, I suppose, and yeah, maintaining the other the things we have. Oh, this other one. Yeah, the big one thing I I forgot to tell you about was the directory. So we've had this thing where you can do a check uh, from a website. Yeah. So we've had a directory that hasn't been changed for a long time. And it's partly because there was a bit of jQuery code that I didn't understand. I didn't really want to touch because I was a bit scared of. And uh, we finally have a new version of this directory that will be allowing people to find not just green hosting providers, but they'll be able to kind of green their stack by figuring out what component yeah. they're looking for. So if you're like, I'm looking for a provider of object storage that's based in this country and that meets these standards, we would have that. And we're trying to break it down that way because in the last 10 years, I suppose, one of the key things is that web apps and, and services have become more complicated. Yeah. But we think much more about services and consuming services from other people. So if you can plot out a stack, then build it, and then see what your alternatives are, then you can basically swap out the bad bits with better bits. Or if you are stuck with a provider, you can say, hi, can you please move faster on climate? Because now I know there are three alternatives who do what you do, which means I'm no longer stuck with only using you for this. Yeah. So that yeah. was kind of one of the reasons we have around it. Because yeah. 
I, yeah, I feel like uh, I feel like this is something that I don't know if it's going to be regulated at any point in the near future, possibly in the European Union, who tends to go heavier on that kind of mm-hmm. thing. I heard some, there are some rumors about all organizations having to, I don't think it's a rumor, but having to... Oh, it's definitely not a rumor. You're talking about the energy efficiency. Yeah, law. so I, I, it would be interesting to know if that would yeah. also tie in those kind of ancillary things that maybe they don't include at the moment, like your website. And and likewise, yeah. any hosting company, of course, that is their business. So inadvertently, they have to yeah. actually put their money where their mouth is and then et cetera, et cetera. So and it might become yeah. like like many other things at the moment, the sort of a badge of honor. And I can see you have badges to put on your, your site to say, this is a green site. And people, when they're deciding mm-hmm. between two options. Yep. They have their, their 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 principles they want to follow. Yeah. And you give people those that information to to decide. So yeah. For people who are listening in Europe, there is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting mm. Directive, which is the big scary law that everyone's worried about in the same way that people worried about G, uh, GDPR back mm. in the late 2010s. In fact, actually this is where some of the so back in 2018 we ran a conference called OMGDPR, which is all about people thinking, oh my God, there's GDPR coming, right? And we did another one called OMG Climate where a couple of years after, a year after. And that was where this kind of climate unconference idea came from that I mentioned during that prototype fun thing. Yeah. So yes, that's the thing. Sadly, OCSRD doesn't sound quite as funny as OMGDPR. But <laughs> I'm lost in letters already. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, yeah, the- What about OMG CO2? No, that doesn't really, sort of. Uh, no, I, I, yeah. we, I was, I, I've actually got a blog post about what can you come up with as a good pun around this? And uh, we couldn't find much in the end. Like OMG M is probably the, the closest we got. <laughs> and- that ended up being that moved into environment variables, which was yeah. the name of the podcast that we do with the Green Software Foundation. So that was it. But I'm I, I'm very very open to suggestions yeah. for any kind of CSRD themed pun <laughs> that we can think about because put that in your <laughs> yeah just... Europe has so there's the in Europe you've got this law that just, that's landing kind of nowish yep. which is the Energy Efficiency Directive, which basically says that the carbon intensity of electricity has to get three times as good by between now and 2030. Mm. And there's a bunch of things that people need to meet now. And Germany has the same law, has a similar version of it called the EEG, which is the Energy Efficiency Gazette, I think something along those lines. So you have that. And there's stuff in America as well. Mm. California landed yep. their own one, but sure. sadly, none of them are very good for coming up with clever puns yet. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll happily share some links for this because what we really need is a kind of green law that that, that shortens to a good meme-worthy pun, <laughs> and then like we're laughing basically. <laughs> I feel like that's a perfect place to end. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you so much for your time. This was fun, Chris. I, it's, it's lovely to hear from you again, and I'm glad to see you taking some time into this. And I don't think it's in—I don't think it's unintentional. It looks very deliberate, and I'm very, very glad you're kind of becoming a fellow traveller and joining the movement because, yeah, it's going to take a lot more of us to actually shift how people think about yep. technology and move towards something which is hopefully greener and more equitable exactly. and, and more just. I will in- include the notes, but the, the Green Web Foundation, all one word, .org is where to find more. And you seem to be most yep. active on LinkedIn as far as I can tell. Well, yeah, I, I don't even know what to call X, Twitter, no, whatever I, it is. All so of them far, are kind of like dead anyway. I don't think this is the kind of subject that would go down well. So I think LinkedIn yeah. is probably your best bet. <laughs> yeah, I use LinkedIn at the moment. And the other things that I would just draw people's attention to would be I'm kind of available. I'm invisible on Mastodon, mastodon.social. And so my name is Chris Adams. I'm Mr. Chris Adams everywhere because Chris Adams has already been taken by someone who was smarter than me and maybe more of an early adopter but I couldn't yeah that's comment to find the end because everything. i yeah. have been squatting on christian chiller everywhere against <laughs> many other people's dislike so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome thank you so much again take care this is fun chris take care of yourself and have a lovely weekend all right and that was my interview with chris adams the director of the green web foundation so what is new with me not a great deal because i've just finished up my last events for the year which was slush Last week, it was cold. I mean, it normally is, but it was colder than normal, but great little event. I did a few interviews there. 
and I'm still even getting together the interviews from Web Summit. So lots and lots and lots of interviews for you to look forward to moving forward. That does mean I haven't really had much time to produce any videos or things like that. I currently do have the text version, the blog post version of my scoring apps way up video over on the Scoring Notes blog. I guest blogged over there, which is a great website and blog and resource for people interested in music applications, basically, as you might better tell from the title. And I am about to release, possibly when you're listening to this, it's already there on YouTube, a video looking at actions for Obsidian, connecting up Obsidian to Apple Shortcuts, and there'll be a text version of that very soon. And there'll also be a bit of sponsored content coming out. But for now, I think those are the main updates from me. But December, January is going to be massive, massive, massive catch-up month. So a lot more when no one's really paying attention because it's December, January. But hey, it'll all be there waiting for you when you're ready. If you enjoy the show, then please do share the episode with someone. Please leave a review wherever you are listening to the show. That is greatly appreciated and something I am trying to boost right now. So as always, I have been Christian Chiller. As always, thank you very much for joining me. And please do take care, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. Find out more about me at chrischinchilla.com, where you can find show notes, sign up for my newsletter, and find all of my writing, games, work, and video links. There's also details on how to get in touch with me. And if you want to get even closer to what I do, join my Discord server for behind-the-scenes discussions and helping me produce my shows and work.